see everybody this morning here, and uh, we'll be continuing in our study in uh, 1 Thessalonians, a letter that Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica. We used the intro uh, last week, uh, the first chapter, uh, to talk about our vision statement for the year and the things that we need to do to allow uh, God to move in our church and our lives. Uh, today, in chapter 2, uh, Paul is writing about his ministry to the Thessalonians. Um, we're going to use it to kind of, kind of a, a test for any ministry. Uh, let's read verse 1 and then we will pray. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 1 says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you is not in vain. Let's pray. Our Father, we just thank you, Lord, again for this day and this chance to gather together, Lord, and open the bread of life. Lord, may you remove distractions and just clear our thoughts and our minds. And Lord, may we know that you are near. Lord, may we read and hear these words and God, may you change our hearts. May you change our outlook in this world. And God, may you give us boldness to live the lives that you've called us to live. So God, we just praise you again. We thank you. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Paul wrote in chapter 1 about the their faith and example of the church at Thessalonica. Now he's uh, kind of redirecting um, to the same audience, that church in Thessalonica. He says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you is not in vain. Paul is, is answering in this chapter uh, some accusations, some problems, some issues, that uh, some lies uh, that people are bringing up against him and his ministry. Um, we know that he was ran out of Thessalonica after only three weeks of being there, um, left behind uh, Timothy and Silas, who have now joined him, and he's writing this letter back to them uh, from their report. So he starts off with here in chapter 2, For you yourself know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. Means there was a truth, there was a purpose in Paul going to Thessalonica. Verse 2, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Remember Paul in Philippi. Remember how he's, he was beaten and mocked and, and put in the shackles and ran out of town. In the midst of that, in the midst of being treated like that, being beaten, being put in stocks, being left, he still had boldness in God to continue with the gospel. Is there any other job that you've ever done, that you love so much, felt so deeply about, that if someone beat you for it, mocked you for it, threw you in, in the stocks for it, and ran you out of town where you were doing that, that, that you would say, ah, I think I want to keep doing that. No. We would probably like, ah, I don't want to do that anymore. That's not worth it to me. Personal sacrifice isn't worth it for that job or for that occupation or that uh, pastime or whatever you were doing. Many of us may even feel that way about the gospel. That if something that bad were to happen to us and declaring the gospel to someone, I'll say, you know, I think I'll just keep this to myself. I think I'll just 
not be vocal, not be outward with my expression of the gospel, with, with what I believe. But Paul was so changed by the gospel, was so changed by Christ, that he still had boldness to go and say, I've got to go tell him. Yeah, I'm done with Philippi, but I've got to go tell somebody else. So he goes to Thessalonica. Or Thessalonica. And it wasn't in vain. There was a purpose in Paul going with a boldness in God to declare the gospel. Verse 3 for our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext of greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, so we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous to you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become so very dear to us. Paul says a lot there. He didn't come with flattery, with impurity or error. He came with a sincere gospel to change the lives and hearts of those in Thessalonica. Here is the test for us today. You see back here they didn't have internet, there weren't websites, there wasn't YouTube, there wasn't uh, Facebook Live or anything else for you to watch preachers. There wasn't bookstores with, with Books lined of theological thought and, and self-help. And still yet, Paul is here defending his gospel, defending his ministry against lies and, and deceit and, and evil thought. Can you imagine if every move Paul had made was broadcast on Facebook, if every... See, what happens today is that preachers get on TV and on Facebook and, and give a message and um, you can go back and, and take a clip from that, cut it completely out of context and say, this guy's a heretic. Or you can watch a whole bunch of somebody and say, that guy's a heretic. We need to be careful with who we listen to. We need to be careful with what we read. If you go to a bookstore or Walmart even, this, this Lifeway's closed at the door so you can't go in there anymore. But if you're looking for a theological or a Christian faithful book to read and, and help you understand um, grace or, or truth or uh, blessings or whatever they are and if what you're looking at is some preacher's face on the book cover I'd be very careful if you're browsing the TV channels and the advertisement for ministry is that preacher's face. I'd be very careful. Because who are you listening to and what are you watching when they make it about them? When the image of their ministry is their face. When the image of their ministry is, look at me, what I've done... Be very careful in reading or listening to them. Paul here is defending. He's not saying, look how good I am, look at what I did. He's, he's defending 
problems in Thessalonica, reminding the church of Thessalonica that he didn't come to them with error or impurity or an attempt to deceive. And just as he was approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God. He wasn't tickling ears. He wasn't trying to make them feel better about themselves or about their situation or about their lives or pumping them up with, with flattery. He was looking to please God and doing what God had called him to do. He says, as you know, and with pretext of greed, was Paul getting rich off teaching the gospel? No. Did Paul build a big mansion from his riches of preaching the gospel and, and going on mission trips? No. You might look up some of your favorite preachers since we have the internet now and everything's on the internet. Somebody's got a drone and flying over their house and taking pictures of it. You might look up your, your favorite TV preacher or your favorite author and see where they live. See if, and just ask yourself the question once you look at their house, is there a pretext of greed in this ministry? What is the purpose of all of this? He says, God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from people. That's the face on the book. Whether from you or from others. Though we could have made, have made demands as apostles of Christ. They, they could have demanded glory. They could have demanded, look at us. We're apostles. We, we were in the presence of Jesus Christ. They were gentle among you. Like a nursing mother taking care of her own child. Paul's ministry in Thessalonica was very gentle. It was, it, it was, here's the gospel. He didn't spoon feed it to them. He gave them the gospel, the whole gospel. But it's very careful, it's very gentle, it's very not look at me, not flashy. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were not... We, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. Because they were servants. Paul and Timothy and Silas were servants of God. If we want ministry to succeed, it can't be about us. It can't be flashy or about money or about flattery or... You have to be a servant. Verse 9 says, For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked day and night that we might not be a burden to any of you. While we proclaim to you the gospel of God. They were servants. Paul and Timothy and Silas on mission for God, but servants of Christ. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with, ch uh, with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you with, to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Paul is talking here about being imitators. Remember in... Chapter 1, he says, you're an example. You're imitators of us and of Christ. It's the same thing here. We exhorted each of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. Who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So the question here is, if we're all ministers, which we are, if you're a believer, you're called into ministry. 
I mean, not to be the pastor, but you're called to minister the gospel to those around you. Are you walking in a manner worthy of God? Do we realize and do we take into account, do we take into effect that God calls us into his own kingdom and glory? To be ministers, to be servants, to proclaim the gospel with our lives. It's not just words that we say. Today makes it easy to get on the internet or, or type some words or, or go live on, on so many social media apps that everybody wants to say something, right? Everybody wants to go live and, and have followers and have people. Paul reminds us here in his letter back to Thessalonica that it's also about conduct. It's about how you live your life to walk in a manner worthy of God. So is that your life? Is, is your life walking in a manner worthy of God? Verse 13 says, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as words of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. I know that there's a fear. We talk about Paul being bold in presenting the gospel, Paul being bold in, in continuing his ministry despite what had happened in Philippi. Continuing now, and despite what had happened in Thessalonica, that he was run out after three weeks. But there's a fear of rejection, isn't there? It's hard to begin that gospel conversation with someone because there's a fear of rejection. We can all be honest and say, yeah, I don't know what to say or how to say it, and so I... I'm afraid they'll slam the door in my face or, or walk away from me or that I'll end a friendship or... What Paul reminds us of here is that it's not our words. The gospel is not ours. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's what it really is, is the word of God. So when we have the opportunity to have a gospel conversation with someone, to present the gospel to someone who, who's, we know from our interactions, may not be a believer, it's not us. And we shouldn't make it about us and our fear and our doubt. And it's about the Word of God. It's about the gospel of Christ, which can save and change. Paul reminds me that it's at work in you believers. So not only is Paul telling them what he did and, and, and why he did it and reminding them that it was the power of Christ in him and through him and for him that went forth, but also says there, it's at work in you believers. That the same power, the same gospel, the same word of God is at work in you believers. Can you feel the word of God working in your life? When you read the word of God, does it make a change in your life? Maybe if you just read it as just something to check off for that day, like, yeah, I read that chapter today. Okay, good. I'm done. Probably won't change you. But if God's word is alive and sharper than any two edged sword, cuts, it should change us. It should be at work in us. So the more you read, the more it works in you, right? The more you study, the more you pray, the more it works in you. 
And if you let the Word of God work in you, isn't part of that work to, to go out? I mean, we're like teapots, right? We, we fill up and we've got to be poured out, right? We fill up and we, we pour out. We fill up and we pour out. Paul says in verse 14, For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews. Was life in Thessalonica easy after Paul left? No. The same people that were chasing Paul were still there, still causing problems, still spreading rumors, still hating on them. Paul says that you're imitators of the churches in Judea because Judea went through the same thing with, with the Jews that when they believed and they, they accepted the gospel of Christ and, and they tell their Jewish brothers and sisters that, hey, I, I believe in Jesus. It wasn't easy for them. And yet the gospel grew. There was a time here in America that the gospel was growing and, and, and going forth. If you study society and, and, and the waves of different generations, you see that we've been in a downturn with the gospel. We've been in a downturn in church life. And you can look at it now and go, oh, what's going to happen? The, the sky is falling. No. There's been a calling of true believers. That the church now is, is down to the, the faithful. We're going to go from here. We're going to regroup. We're going to say... COVID and other things, okay, it's, it's done. But what are we doing now? Now we regroup. Now we concentrate on what Paul is saying here. We've been entrusted with the gospel. And we let the gospel work in us so that we can go out and be imitators of Christ in the community around us. Will there be suffering of the church today? There might be. We're facing times where churches aren't looked at so highly, are they? There's a lot of talk of, of, of taxes and other breaks that we've been given as um, nonprofit organizations. Wanting to tax the churches. Wanting to do all these things to the churches, really <coughs> come down on the churches. As easy as it is to go live on Facebook and other things, you, you've also got to realize that there's bad coming in. It's easy to, to see a church upload a video and go comment, we hate you, or some other rhetoric. It's so easy now. And it's really the cool thing to do is to be anti-church. When I was growing up, it was the cool thing to be in church. Now the cool thing is anti-church. Let Paul's words encourage us. He continues in verse 15 about the Jews. It says, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So it's always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath has come upon them at last. What is Paul saying there that the wrath has come upon them at last in Judea, the Jews in Judea? Paul is saying that 
now anyone who doesn't believe in Christ, wrath is coming upon them. We may not see it in this life. We may not see it as they live. The wrath is upon that. The wrath of God is on those who do not believe. From that we can go to John chapter 3. Verse 16, which we all love and memorize. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And we stop there with what we say, don't we? Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Okay, you get that. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he does not believe in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come in the world, and people love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light has not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. And that's the people Paul is dealing with here in Thessalonica. They love darkness, those not in the church. So they don't come to the light. They don't come to church. You think we're there in America today? The people love darkness rather than the light? Yes. The same social medias that we try to portray the gospel, try to portray Christ, try to get the message out. Just browse over a few profiles and be blown away by sin. And wrath will one day come upon them. Reminder we're talking about being bold, being given boldness, being entrusted with the gospel. That it is Christ who saves. And it is only Christ who saves. It is not us who saves. It's not our words that saves. It's not our life that saves. I can sit and I can write out some pretty convincing words. I can grab a thesaurus so I can use word which has a thesaurus built in and, and make some big words and, and, and proclaim some really big things, but it is not my words that say this. It's not my words living that saves. So when you fear that gospel conversation, when you fear rejection for what you really want to tell somebody, you have that friend who's living a life that you know is not led by the gospel. You know that they're probably not saved by the words that they say and what they do in their life. Yet yeah, you've been friends a long time. And you fear that conversation where you, you know you need to tell them about Jesus. You know they need to change their life to be saved. I said that back. You don't even need to change in life. So you need to be saved. You don't change to be saved. But we still fear that conversation, don't we? We still fear even beginning that sentence of come to church with me. It's 
hard, isn't it? It's hard to, to go to someone that you've lived with your whole life and say, do you know Jesus? Because I don't think you do. Maybe you wouldn't do it in that tone. But. Be encouraged by this. It is not you or your words that saves. God is just wanting us to be obedient and bold and allow the gospel to work in and through us. Because it is he who saves. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It's not by us. It's not us who has to get them there. It's We're just the vessel to deliver the message that Jesus saves. So as we read Paul's letter, and we'll keep reading his letter to the Thessalonica, be encouraged that God is wanting to work in and through you, through his gospel, through the word of God. And it is that gospel that saves. It is not us. It's not your responsibility to save them. You might want to drag them to church. But it's not your responsibility to save them. That is on Christ. That's on the Holy Spirit. That burden, that work is on them. It's not on us. So that we can go and freely have the conversation. Hey, you why don't you come to church with me? I was reading in the Bible the other day, and you know, we, we talked about this the other day, and, and it really brought me to, to this scripture. And just a gentle entrance into a gospel conversation. <clears throat> just as Paul was gentle in Thessalonica. Just as the gospel is gentle and working in us. Let's pray. Our Father, we just thank you. God, that you seek to encourage us today to be bold in living out and presenting the gospel. Lord, may your spirit work in us. May the word of God work in us. <clears throat> To live our lives in a way worthy of you. But also in a way that presents the gospel to those around us. Well, may they see our different conduct, our different speech, our different way of life. And Lord, may they want to know the reason for those things. Lord, if there's one here today or listening who doesn't know he's Lord and Savior. Lord, if it's fear of the wrath can make up one that we talked about. If it's the fear of just slipping away from your presence. That, Lord, whatever it takes, draw them to you today. Make today the day of their salvation. That they may know that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. He was buried and three days later rose again to give us eternal life. Conquering death in the grave. Lord, if we know someone on our hearts today that needs to hear those words, may you give us boldness to go and proclaim that today. Lord, move in our hearts today. Give us a boldness and an encouragement to go share. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.